at uh, biological control and, and uh, uh, also looking at, at uh, uh, cultural mechanical control, but we still used pesticides in, in quite a bit. Uh, I guess the, the first thing that I want to point out is, is we're going to delve into some pretty politically hot issues. Uh, and unfortunately, there are uh, a lot of opinions going around. But as a scientist, uh, I believe in the scientific method. And, and that is uh, we make observations uh, and we try to, uh, you know, repeat those observations. And when we see some commonality of those uh, observations, uh, we try to make some hypotheses of causes and effects, uh, and then we go out and test it. And as, as indicated here, we test, test, test. And the problem that I'm seeing with many of these politically hot issues right now is that we often get uh, one study that somehow gets published. Uh, uh, and in some cases, it's, it's properly vetted and reviewed in the scientific community. And in many other areas, uh, it doesn't seem to have been properly vetted. And of course, when retested and, and the experimental procedure is redone, uh, the results of those experiments cannot be duplicated. Probably the most infamous of that one uh, a few years ago was the uh, claim that BT corn, uh, the putting uh, the caterpillar active BT gene into corn was going to kill off uh, all the monarch butterflies. Uh, and, and there was a study done where the monarch butterfly larvae were fed the pollen uh, from that BT corn, and, and sure enough, you could kill them. But when it was taken out into the field by other scientists and looked at, they were naval, never able to kill a, a single uh, monarch butterfly from the uh, pollen from BT corn. And, and so uh, we, we've uh, rejected that uh, hypothesis that the BT corn pollen is dangerous. Uh, to the caterpillars. And, and so, again, as a scientist, uh, we, I believe in that scientific method that we need to, to test hypotheses, reevaluate them, and, and either accept or reject them. As I mentioned before, uh, we're, we're getting into some pretty hot areas. And, and as an urban landscape entomologist, uh, uh, obviously the, the biggest one that occurred this last uh, summer uh, was the massive uh, bumblebee kill that occurred out in Oregon. Uh, and again, uh, the, the minute that all of my fellow entomologists, who are also urban entomologists, heard what had happened, uh, I think the general uh, trend that we said is what idiots would have done that. Uh, but the reality is is, is that uh, we had somebody, that, that a professional uh, landscape manager, who went out and sprayed linden trees that were in full bloom of course, he was claiming that he sprayed them at 7 o'clock in the morning when there were no bees. And there's the rest of us that, that are saying, wait a second, um, you know, uh, that just because there weren't bees at that time, uh, were, were you not observant enough? Do you not know anything about a linden tree? Uh, it's highly attractive to uh, all kinds of pollinators and, and so forth. But be that as it may, uh, it was a person who didn't follow the instructions on the label that uh, even though the label says uh, do not apply when, when bees are active, uh, and, and they're now sort of uh, trying to play word games with that, what we mean by being active is that they would be attractive to the bees uh, over that period of time. We also have to realize that we're dealing with uh, uh, a group of people out there. And I suspect I'm going to irritate some of the participants here. Uh, we have a group of people that, that are out there that believe that pesticides are the major ills of this earth uh, and that uh, uh, pesticides should be banned. Uh, we're seeing this in Europe. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we're also Europe is uh, reaping some of the benefits of, of banning the pesticides that they've banned. Uh, we've seen the same effect occurring in, Can in Canada. Uh, there have been some recent bans of, of, as they say, cosmetic use of pesticides uh, in Canadian provinces. And now we find people going out and, and uh, getting all kinds of illegal materials to apply them or mixing up their own pest control products when, in reality, if they had just left uh, good enough alone uh, and, and were using the, the products that were registered by Ag Canada, uh, we wouldn't have uh, the, the secondary effects. I guess what I'm indicating is that 
we have a, a group of people out there that are always saying, you know, we need to use the, the least toxic. And, and my feeling is you've got to be very careful when talking to these kinds of people because the reality is what they're saying is they don't want any toxin. They, they don't want any pesticides in the environment. Uh, and it has my, been my experience that, like all tools, whether it happens to be a car, whether it happens to be uh, the, the furnace in your, in your home, uh, if it happens to be your refrigerator, if you use it correctly, there's no problem. If you use it incorrectly, you can have problems. And, and so, uh, again, we don't need to, to uh, get suckered into that debate uh, because the, the reality is, is most of these people have already made up their mind that uh, all pesticides are bad. And, and uh, when you do that, you're dealing with people's beliefs. Uh, and, and these can get uh, in, in the same mode as, as religion, politics, and abortion. And for those of you that have ever had to get into those debates, you know that uh, the person has made up their mind and there's not much that you're going to do to change that. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess the other thing we need to, to watch out for is, is charged words. And I'm seeing in this honeybee debate, uh, everything being thrown everywhere. And, and we're, we're seeing uh, the, the natural versus synthetic, the organic versus uh, chemical, uh, the, the natural versus genetically engineered, and, and so forth. And, and the reality is is that we need to sort of dial back uh, the, that uh, uh, debate that we've got and, and try to use more uh, reasonable terminology uh, to make our points. Some of the other things that I think we need to, to be aware of is that uh, actually I was a math major uh, before I became an entomologist and I find it kind of interesting that there are things that you can do with numbers that give people the wrong impression of what's going on. And, and an example of that uh, if you take a, an example of, of a very low incident thing going on, uh, let's say if we had one in a million uh, events that occurred, and then in the next year you had two in that one million, obviously the headlines say that, that it doubled, uh, it increased by 100%, and, and so you can see that it, it uh, it's still a very low incident, uh, that this is... Uh, less than, than one hundredth of a percent uh, change, but the reality is, is, is you can play with those numbers and uh, make them sound uh, bad. Now, what I find is interesting, this occurs on the increase. Take a look what happens uh, when, when uh, you, you, oops, excuse me, when you decrease things, if you take that two in a million versus one in a million, now it only decreased by 50%. But when you went the other direction, it increased by 100%. And of course, this is an old math trick. Uh, the, the, the magnitude of change is the same. Uh, but the, the uh, perception of that change uh, is quite different. Another example that we had here in Ohio a few years ago was uh, uh, we were looking at, at the contamination of pesticides uh, in drinking water, and, and they had done a, a test uh, where they found 12 out of 400 wells uh, in uh, one year had pesticides, so that was 3% of the wells, and then a few years later, uh, in order to determine how well they were doing, uh, they, they found 10 of 100 wells. Now, uh, as uh, if you look at the statistics of this, number one, it's not the same uh, number set. In other words, you, you use 400 wells in 92, you only use uh, 100 wells in 95, and as you can probably guess, where did they go back to sample? Uh, and indeed, they went back to the particular areas where they had detected these pesticides before. And, and again, to the unknowing person, the person who doesn't see the methods and materials in, in this particular study, uh, the headlines obviously say that, that there's over a 300% a increase, when in reality, if they went back and sampled the same wells, uh, it's actually a decrease. We went from 12 to 10 of those wells uh, that had some pesticide contamination. Now, again, in my view, <coughs> when we're talking about pesticides, uh, we have people that have various views of these, um, and the first one is the pastoral view, and, and I probably ought to give you a talk on, on this one. I have another talk that's uh, uh, titled Pest Control by the Victorian Housewife. 
And in that particular uh, study, uh, there was actually a, uh, a Better Homes and Gardens, our, our Good Housekeeping uh, magazine survey that was done in the, the late 1880s. And uh, this is to control the different insects around the house. And I find it interesting. Uh, they were talking about bed bugs. They were talking about fleas and flies and so forth. And the number one insecticide that was uh, indicated by the Victorian housewife that was most effective was mercury chloride, which today is obviously banned. It would be a category one insecticide with skull and crossbones and so forth, but it was used very commonly. Uh, likewise, I remember going to my uh, grandparents' farm in Kansas uh, back in the, the 50s, uh, and Grandma had me dust the uh, potato plants and tomato plants in order to get a, a, a soda pop, and it wasn't until a few years later that I found out that I was dusting the tomatoes and the potato plants and myself uh, with lead arsenate. Uh, and, and again, uh, I think we have to, to kind of reevaluate that that sort of pastoral view of the past uh, may not have been reality. The other thing that we see is the organic view. We're seeing a lot of uh, push right now for everything green, everything organic. Uh, and I think the, the reality is, is that uh, there are some good organic materials, there are some good organic products, uh, but then there are some other products that, that don't work at all. Uh, another thing that we see is, is I think in, in today's uh, living, uh, we live a very good lifestyle, but I find it kind of interesting. The same people that are complaining uh, that, we're, that uh, we're using too many pesticides and they see no risk in banning pesticides, uh, are also the one that are, are complaining about why don't we have a good bed bug control? Well, the reason why we don't have a good bed bug control is that EPA will not allow us to register uh, one of the organophosphates uh, in, in the urban habitats and urban residential areas. Uh, and so we're stuck basically with pyrethroid insecticides, which is all that EPA has allowed us to have. Uh, and the bed bugs are resistant to that, and, and so there are some there are risk for banning pesticides, and, and I definitely don't buy into the idea that life is better without pesticides. That leads into uh, probably a little lesson in, in toxicology, and, and uh, a lot of people are saying we, we need to use low toxicity material or non toxic materials. Uh, and the, the reality is, is, is that uh, uh, we, uh, you know, all toxicologists will say that uh, there is, uh, uh, everything is toxic at one level or another. Now we move into natural. What about natural materials? Uh, and basically these are not, not synthetic. Uh, again, I think we have to, to realize we have to evaluate each one of these products on its own basis. And, and the, the reality is, uh, uh, if you take a look at natural products, uh, you know, water, oil, silicon dioxide, those are, are fairly uh, low toxicity materials, but also mercury and lead are natural, and, and we consider those to be highly toxic. Same thing, oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, and methane are all natural, but I think if you compare the, the four of those, you'll find out there are some there that you definitely wouldn't want to deal with. If you take a look at, at natural plant products, uh, obviously sugar, azadiractin have very low toxicity, but ricin, which comes from uh, castor uh, beans, uh, is one of the most toxic uh, molecules that we know. So what are we really talking about in this? Uh, a lot of people say we need to be environmentally responsible. And, and uh, you, you hear all kinds of alert terms that are associated with that. Low impact, sustainability, green, and organic. And, and what do we mean by those? Well, if we really check with what the environmentalists are talking about, uh, they're, they're worried about fertilizer pollution. And I found it interesting uh, just in my uh, uh, billing for my water and utilities just this uh, last month, my wife pointed out that the, uh, the Columbus City had pointed out that the fertilizer on my lawn was killing all of the, the uh, birds and fish and uh, polluting the water. And, and the reality is, is that, uh, indeed, uh, lawn fertilizers that are applied to hard surfaces and are allowed to wash down the, the uh, uh, storm sewer system can cause some pretty bad ill effects. 
the fertilizer supplied to the lawns do not leave the lawns. They're actually absorbed by the, the uh, turf grass plants. They're allowed to infiltrate into the soil where they're mineralized and basically don't move off site. <coughs> so what about the, the pesticides? Uh, again, virtually all of the pesticides that I see, uh, if used correctly and according to the labels, really pose very little uh, uh, adverse effects in the urban environment. A lot of people are saying, well, our, our urban environments lack animal diversity. And, and again, I have to chuckle, the, the, the Europeans are actually far ahead of us uh, in this. And, and what we're really looking at primarily are birds and mammals and not the other organisms that are in there. But in essence, what we're finding uh, is that the turf, the ornamentals uh, that are in our urban habitats are much more biologically diverse than any of the natural woodlands uh, or prairies that are around. And, and this has been well proved. Again, uh, in Europe, they're beginning to come into the urban habitats and they're finding out that the number of species of plants, the number of species of animals often is twice the number uh, of those same uh, organisms uh, that would be in nearby forested areas uh, or prairie areas. And, and even while we call these green deserts, the reality is they are quite biodiverse. They are very complex. I find it also kind of interesting that, that the people that are usually stating this often have this sort of a view. They have what I call a sort of pastoral view of the landscape. They'd like to have their landscape with, with a bunch of trees in the back. Uh, they'd like to have uh, the, this meadow in the front. And of course, everybody's now uh, putting in a water feature uh, in their landscape. And, and then they wonder why they might have mosquitoes uh, and other problems with that. I think the reality is we have to face the, the bottom line reality is this is our urban habitats. Uh, the urban habitats, if you take a look at this image, uh, are quite a spectrum. Uh, and and uh, again, if you take just a look at the greenness of the lawns in this particular image, and what you'll find is that about half the, the lawns, uh, and actually the number is closer to 40%, about 40% of these lawns are being maintained, they're being fertilized. Uh, the other 60%, nothing's being done to them other than they're being mowed on a regular basis. They might get an herbicide treatment maybe once every three or four years when the weeds get really bad. Uh, and usually none of them receive insecticides until something really happens uh, they get chinch bugs or bill bugs or white grubs, and then they try to do a rescue treatment. In my feeling, uh, this is a typical landscape that I see in central Ohio. Uh, the biggest problem that I see with this landscape is that uh, we're using what I call pest risky plants. Uh, if you take a look, there's a purple leaf plum. Uh, again, that's Japanese beetle food. It's, it's scale food. There's a birch tree in here, which again is, is going to be a birch leaf miner, bronze birch borer, uh, all kinds of insects. We've got the typical Kentucky bluegrass in here, which is going to be highly susceptible to, to virtually all of the turf insects. We can do a lot better than this. So we, we've got lots of plants that don't get uh, a lot of pests in them. We've got lots of plants that can provide better resources uh, for the organisms uh, that are going to be occupying uh, these areas. Well, you're probably saying right now, OK, Bug Doc, but what about the bees?
study uh, is that in a new lawn in a disturbed habitat, the columbola just went off the scale, uh, and it actually took them several years to sort of get down to a, a more ecologically stable uh, number. And, and so we can see that, indeed, turf grasses, when they're established, are disturbed habitats, uh, and some things can go uh, uh, and, and interesting numbers and populations in those disturbed habitats. Well, again, I've, as you can tell, we, we've sort of gotten off the track here, and, and uh, I suppose you're still asking me, uh, uh, hey, Bug Doc, uh, you know, that, that's great and wonderful that we have these uh, biologically diverse urban habitats, but what about the bees? Well, I think, uh, again, a point of view of the bee. If you think about this, this is the habitat of most of our bees. Even if you happen to, to plunk down uh, some honeybee colonies in, in these particular areas, these honeybees are, are going to be foraging over probably a, a mile area, maybe even further. Same thing with many of our other bees. Uh, they're, they're probably only going to forage locally. If they can't get what they need locally, they're going to move to far away places uh, to wherever the resources. But as you can see here, in most of our urban habitats, and indeed, we've, we've got residential areas, we've got parks and grounds areas, uh, we have commercial site areas, and so forth. But uh, if you take a look at this, there's an awful lot of trees, shrubs, turf, uh, a, a great deal of, of uh, diversity going on here, which should provide adequate food, water, and space for our bees. Now, how do we avoid poisoning the bees. Uh, let's, let's put it in, in technical or non-technical words here. Uh, how do we uh, get through this? Well, this is actually something that has been discussed for years. And, and uh, I want to thank Barb Bletcher, who is our, our Ohio Department of Agriculture State Apris, for providing me with some of her slides. And, and she said that she's, uh, for years, has presented this particular talk and used these uh, particular uh, slides. The reality is we've always known that uh, uh, there are insecticides can ha that ha can have ill effects uh, on uh, our pollinators and specifically on the honeybees. And these are some, of, I find it kind of interesting, these are some of the things that, that we've typically stated uh, in, in the past that, uh, you know, do not treat uh, crops or, or uh, things that are near uh, plants that are flowering. Uh, obviously, the bees are most active during the daytime, and, and so if you can uh, either, either make an application early in the morning or late in the evening, but even that we have to be careful because we're talking about what is the residues of those, and, and this is obviously a mistake that was done out in Oregon. The, the people that were spraying the, the linden trees did not fully understand that the residues, the active residues of that pesticide was going to be on this flowering plant for at least uh, several days after that application. Uh, and, and even while we've got these sort of general guidelines, uh, we need to also understand the chemical nature of our particular pesticide that we're using. We also can take a look at, at different formulations. And, and we've always known that, that dust uh, are, are about the size of pollen grains, and these can be picked up by the bees. Uh, what I find is interesting is EPA has pretty well banned most of the dust and most of the wettable powder materials. Uh, they're, they're no longer available because they were actually causing problems to the mixing and, and loaders uh, in that. And so we've gone to different types of formulations. On the other hand, we've also changed a lot of our insecticides. If, if you take a look at the old list of pesticides, we had a very long laundry list of, of pesticides. Now, while most of these pesticides are still available in the agricultural sector, I'd like to point out in our urban habitat that virtually all of these are gone in the urban habitats. Uh, the ones that remain are bifenthrin, uh, the, the pyrethroids uh, are still remain, some of the tempo, things like that. But we can no longer use uh, 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 Guthion, uh, Dersban, Metasystox R, uh, Diasnon, Dichlorophos has been completely eliminated, Saigon. Vir virtually this whole laundry list has now been uh, eliminated. And the problem is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, what did we substitute back in those? Well, we left the pyrethroids. But what we found was a new category of insecticides. And the new category of insecticides were the neonicotinoids. 
And what was interesting about these, I remember when the first neonicotinoid merit or imidacloprid hit the market on, in uh, uh, 1996, uh, we were all in looking at this and we were saying, how much of this we're going to use? And we said, we're going to use three-tenths of a pound of this. And we had been using five, six to eight pounds of these other organophosphates and carbamates uh, to, to achieve the same control that we did with three-tenths of a pound. The other thing that we found out is that they, they had systemic action, while these other pesticides didn't generally have those systemic actions. And, and so uh, you can imagine that, uh, again, they were highly adopted, highly uh, used, and, and because of these new attributes of low toxicity, low usage rate, but being highly effective. Well, what about those neonicotinoids? Well, what we have found is that while on honeybees, it's kind of interesting. If, if you actually feed a honeybee this, uh, the honeybee doesn't uh, quickly die. But what we now know is with the neonicotinoids, I've always claimed that the neonicotinoids are mood-altering drugs for bugs. And what it happens in this particular case is that even at fairly small levels, uh, what it can cause is disorientation. And, and when you've got an insect uh, like bees or other pollinators that are regularly visiting a site and they're using their navigation system to get to that site and get back to their, their home base, whether it be a single burrow or whether it be a colony, uh, being in the even slightly disoriented is not a good thing. <clears throat> the other thing that we found out about neonicotinoids, and, and uh, we're, I'm not going to mince any words on it, it does end up in the nectar and it does end up in the pollen. What we are finding, however, is that this movement into the nectar and into the pollen seems to be a rather transient event. Uh, it doesn't occur over a long period of time. But uh, again, to the novice, uh, we, we have to be aware that we can detect these insecticides at parts per trillion, when the reality is that it's in parts per million are at the, the activity levels. And, and so even though we can detect levels in the plants of these pesticides at 100 days to 300 days after the application, most toxicologists would point out that they're well below the activity level. They're well below any known level that would have an influence on the different insects. That's obvious. I, I see that all the time. Uh, we, we find people that go out and spray their plants with these neonicotinoids to knock down the Japanese beetles, and then I get a phone call about uh, 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 two to three weeks later and say, Dr. Shetler, I thought this stuff was supposed to last all season. And I said, well, what's the problem? Well, I applied it. It seemed to knock off the Japanese beetles, but here I am two to three weeks later, and they're back again. Well, the reality is, is there are residues still in that plant of that neonicotinoid, but they are not at effective levels. And so the Japanese beetle is back very rarely munching away on those plants. Well, let's take a, an ex probably the most recent example that, that just came out of what I consider to be good research in this particular area. Uh, this is done by a, a colleague, uh, Dan Potter, down in Kentucky. He had a, a graduate student and a technician that assisted him on this, and, and their publication is this uh, assessing uh, uh, insecticide hazards to bumblebees. Uh, obviously, they, de they decided to use bumblebees because uh, bumblebee colonies are cheaper. Uh, the foraging range is smaller uh, than, than honeybees, uh, but I think it, it gives us some good indications of what's going on. What they found is that when they went into uh, turf uh, that had clover in it, uh, and, and the bumblebees were foraging in the clover, uh, it was very obvious that uh, the, the neonicotinoid, in this particular case, uh, they, they picked clothianidin. And what I'm going to take a look at is this lower chart down here. Uh, if you take a look at the, the basically the mortality caused by the clothianidin, very high, very significant uh, uh, problems with that. Now that's compared to the untreated and a newer insecticide, chloranthronyloprol or acelaprin, uh, which again had virtually no effect on them. When they take a look at, at uh, you know, how well the, the colonies survived uh, and, and how well the colonies uh, worked, when you take a look at, at the uh, uh, clothianidin, the neonicotinoid, you can see that there's a significant reduction 
uh, in uh, that colony mean weight as compared to colonies that either were foraging in untreated areas or were foraging where the acelloprin uh, was located. So definitely showed uh, significant effects uh, on these foraging bees. Now, sort of as the post note, uh, Dan, uh, again, is a very good scientist, and he said, okay, uh, and they repeated this experiment, uh, and basically what they did is they went back, uh, and, and in one day they mowed this turf, mowed all of the, the flower heads off of the plants. Within a few days, within three to five days, they were uh, the clover plants were blooming again, and they again put the bumblebees out on those treated areas where the flowers had rebloomed. And what was interesting in that particular case, they saw no significant effect. And so Dan is indicating that uh, when we make a, an application of this neonicotinoid, the risk to the foraging bees is really only about two to three days. And, and so again, what he's recommending, and, and he's actually lobbying EPA to put this on some of the new neonicotinoid uh, uh, labels, not only are you not supposed to apply the neonicotinoid during blooming or flowering of the plants where you're going to have pollinators foraging there, but what he's recommending is that even in lawns where you might have weeds, uh, you can either mow the lawn before you make the application or mow the lawn immediately after the application in order to reduce the chance of having the flowers or the blooms that would contain residues of this neonicotinoid uh, in that uh, uh, flower and in the nectar. Well, I think I've gone on uh, here probably long enough, uh, and, and you're probably saying, well, what about the, the bee-friendly materials? I guess the, uh, here's my opinion uh, on these. The, the real, as far as we can tell, the major bad actor here, the one that, that everybody's raising concern about, is the neonicotinoids. I work very closely with many of the manufacturers of these neonicotinoids. They are concerned also. Um, and the reason why they're concerned is they've seen what's happened in Europe. Uh, they, they don't want a total ban. Uh, they've seen what's happened in, in Oregon. And, and as uh, you can imagine, if their products are completely banned, they can't sell them and so forth. So they're actually working with EPA to modify uh, the, the labels. Uh, my feeling is, again, I'm not too sure I, I appreciate the wording on the labels, uh, but the, the reality is, is that these companies are also going to be sending out more, uh, as they stated, bee-friendly recommendations uh, on the uses of the products. And all we can hope is that the end users will, will begin uh, to follow those instructions. <clears throat> I guess... In my opinion, the bottom line, uh, and, and I tell this right now, I've been saying this for the last two years in all of my conferences, avoid using any of the neonicotinoids if a plant is going to be blooming or entering bloom within two weeks of the application. In other words, if you're going to use an early preventive application of this, make sure that it's done very early, well before uh, the, the plants are in bloom. And you have to be aware of what plants do bloom early. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, remember that maples uh, and elm trees are some of the earliest to bloom, uh, and, and so uh, those would not be good candidates for early spring applications uh, of neonicotinoids. The other technique would be to wait until after bloom has occurred, uh, and, and obviously uh, most of these
bees using bumblebees coming out. Uh, they, they seem to uh, serve as a very good model uh, for it. Now, obviously, they're, they're a bigger organism, uh, but the actual dosage rates uh, per kilogram seems to be pretty close to the same. Uh, and since you can rear bumblebees in smaller colonies and manipulate them, uh, and, and basically cheaper than you can uh, for, for a honeybee uh, colony, uh, they seem to be the model of choice by a lot of entomologists. Hey, Marianne is wondering, how effective is a neonicotinoid application to turf on target insects when you mow right after application? Uh, uh, excellent uh, question, Mary, and, and, and uh, or Mimi. The, the real reality on that one is it depends on whether you remove the clippings or not. Uh, and also depends on, on the application. Now, Potter used a spray application uh, of clothianidin or arena uh, because he wanted to get the maximum coverage and, and so forth. Uh, we're, we're, uh, I think he's beginning to, to look at uh, a potential of repeating that with a granular formulation. Uh, and, and my feeling is, is a granular formulation may have a little bit longer residual because obviously with a granule you'll have a, a little packet uh, of the insecticide that can be released over a little longer period of time. But even that technology is changing because with the new granules, uh, the, the AgriLite uh, and, and DG light uh, granule formulations that most of the insecticides are going on are granules that completely break apart and completely disperse uh, even with a dew event. And, and so uh, my feeling is, is that uh, those are going to release the insecticide very quickly going to be picked up by the plant, and again, uh, hopefully we would have a sort of transient uh, effect of the neonicotinoid ending up in the, the flowering uh, part of that plant. Uh, but when it comes to, to liquid applications, uh, we've always recommended that if you're going to mow it, leave the clippings uh, on the, the surface uh, and don't pick up the clippings because you can remove a significant amount of the insecticide. Dave Pat is asking about a list of pest-resistant plants, maybe a website or a, a source you know. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, there, there's. I'll have to, to see if I can post that for you. Uh, the, the only good list that I've seen uh, that, that's out there was one that was done by Paula Shrewsbury uh, quite a few years ago uh, on the East Coast, and I think it's still floating around out there that lists uh, quite a few of the, the urban plants that seem to be uh, not only uh, in, uh, insect pest resistant, but also disease resistant. Great. Um, Dave, I'm wondering if you actually did roll around in the yard with ground nesting bees, <laughs> as you described. As a matter of fact, I, I even, uh, as I was rolling over, there were uh, a couple of the little sentinel males that were there wondering what in the world is this big animal doing rolling around in their colony. Uh, and I just reached over and, and flicked them with my finger to, just to point out that uh, they're, they're not going to come back at me. Now, obviously, that was a trick because I knew they were the males and didn't have a stinger in the first place. Uh, but I have done the same thing with the, the little females. Uh, I've actually cupped, uh, picked them up and cupped them in my hand uh, and, and shown that when you open your hand, they fly away. They're, they're, unless you restrain them or pinch them, uh, they're not going to sting you. Uh, being a solitary bee is very different than being a, a social bee or wasp. Uh, being social bees or wasp, uh, the, all the females that are in there, there's a good number of them that, that are basically destined. They've been assigned to protect uh, the colony. When you're a solitary, you're the only game in town. And, and so if you happen to decide to sting somebody or something, you have a high probability of being crushed or killed, and you're then out of the ball game. And so I find that, that solitary bees and wasps are, are really very docile uh, as long as you don't try to restrain them or, or uh, uh, overly roughly handle them. And uh, let's finish up with this question. Natalie asks, if a landscape has a lot of flowers and not a lot of grassy plants, should neonicotinoids be used? Absolutely. Uh, it's been my experience that in those particular situations, you don't have... Uh, uh, let, let's face it, the, the insects that are attacking turf grass are there because it's a monoculture of turf grass. Uh, and, and so uh, and, unless you're using some very specific kinds of grasses, 
my recommendation, uh, what I have at home and, and uh, what I recommend to all my neighbors is turf type tall fescue. Uh, this naturally has an endophyte in it which makes it naturally resistant uh, to the, the uh, uh, surface insects especially. The other interesting thing about the tall fescue is it has a very deep ditch root system and it can tolerate up to twice the number of white grubs that a Kentucky bluegrass stand uh, can, can use. And even there, um, I, I'm, I guess I'm brutally honest about it, I haven't used an herbicide in my lawn in about 10 years, and it looks like it. I, I've got a fair amount of clover, uh, I've got some, some dandelions and, and so forth in there, but because over 50% of it is the turf type tall fescue with the endophyte, I still don't see any significant turf insects in there. Uh, and if there's no turf insects of any important, there's no need for me to be applying uh, an insecticide to, to control those insects uh, because they're just not there. And Dave, finally, we know that um, lots of different pesticides can be found in bee products like honey and wax. Do you know if neonicotinoids have been found in honey? James is asking. Uh, yes, there, there's been a couple of reports where, again, you have to be very careful about this. The, the, both uh, the, neonicotinoids, the neonicotinoids have been found both in the wax and in the honey, and it's also been recovered in the pollen. Um, and, of course, when these reports come out, everybody gets all, all bent out of shape and, and crazy over this. But the reality is, is that if you take a look at the Penn State studies especially, they actually find much higher residues of other insecticides, specifically the pyrethroids, in a, in a couple of the cases, the pyrethroids actually were at active levels. The neonicotinoids, even though they were recovered and even though they were, they were detected, uh, were well below any of the biologically active areas. Now, that's probably not much solace for somebody who says, well, I'd like to have some organic honey that doesn't have any pesticides in it. And, and I understand that, that philosophy and that thought, um, and the reality is, is that in this day and age, especially where these neonicotinoids are being used in, in many areas, uh, as well as other pesticides, there will probably always be some chemicals uh, that end up in our honeybee uh, products. Great. Thanks, Dave. I really want to thank you for your time today. And folks, if you'll offer Dave a thank you in the chat pod, I know he would appreciate it. Uh, just to bring your attention to the screen, I have three questions.